Several months ago, I did a series in which I emphasized the importance of having a quiet time. For those of you who aren't familiar with that term, let me explain what a quiet time is. A quiet time is a private one-on-one -on -one time with God that you do first thing in the morning. During that time, you're going to pray, read your Bible, meditate on what you've read, and listen to the voice of God. Now, the reason that it's referred to as a quiet time is because you need a quiet and secluded place so you can listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying to you through the Word of God and as you pray. But the emphasis is on listening to God because God wants to speak to you. I am blown away at the number of Christians who think that God does not speak today. God speaks to us in many ways. And he wants to speak to you in your quiet time. Now, there are three reasons why you need to have a quiet time. The first reason is because it's the only way to develop an intimate relationship with God. You see, you can't know God if you don't spend time with God. That's the way that relationships work. If you want to know someone, then you have to spend time with them. Well, it works the same way with God. If you want to know God, then you have to spend time with him. The second reason you need to have a quiet time is so that you can increase your knowledge of the Bible. You see, the more you know, the more you grow as a Christian. In fact, if you're not learning, you're not growing. In essence, you have arrested development, which means you've stopped maturing as a Christian. And that shouldn't be happening, and it wouldn't be happening if you had a quality, quiet time with God every morning. The third reason that you need to have a quiet time is because the process itself requires you to evaluate yourself on a daily basis. Notice what 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says. It says, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and it teaches us to do what is right. Do you see that? God's word makes us realize when we're wrong and what's wrong in our life. In other words, it points out where we're screwing up and where we're failing. But it also shows us what we should be doing in order to succeed. So having a quiet time is kind of like going through a self-help course every morning. Yeah. How many of you like self-help books? You want, to, you want to learn something. You want to get better. Well, that's what happens when you have a quiet time and you're praying and you're reading your Bible. So that's the three reasons why everyone should have a quiet time on a daily basis. And this morning, I want, to, I want to encourage you to start having a quiet time if you're not doing so. In fact, this fall, what I do, I'm going to do is I'm going to post a weekly video on Facebook that will feature what I've gleaned from my own personal quiet time during that week. And my purpose for doing that is twofold. First of all, I want to show you how I do my personal quiet time. And secondly, I want to show you how valuable having a quiet time is by sharing what I'm learning and how I'm growing through my quiet time. Let me just tell you, it's no different for pastors than it is for everyone else. If I don't have a quiet time, I'm not growing. I'm experiencing arrested development. I'm not maturing as a Christian. If I want to grow as a Christian, it's not enough to study to be able to prepare a sermon. I've got to have a personal quiet time. So I want to show you how to do that. Plus, as I post this weekly, you'll get a chance to uh, maybe get some insight on how to make your quiet time better. Now, I probably need to explain how my quiet time is structured, especially since I uh, mentioned the process. First, I start with prayer and meditation, which for me lasts about 20 to 30 minutes. And I follow the Lord's Prayer as an outline. And after I prayed, I read God's Word from the one-year Bible. This is the one-year Bible. So whatever the date is, I turn to that page and I read what's assigned to that date. There's always an Old Testament passage, a New Testament passage, a psalm, and a couple of verses from the book of Proverbs. And if you read what you're supposed to every day, you'll have read the entire Bible in one year. That's why it's called the one-year Bible. It helps you to read the entire Bible all the way through in one year. Now, it usually takes me about 10 minutes to read what I'm supposed to. But depending upon how fast you read or how slow you read, it might take you a little longer. It might not take you as much time. And then after I've read what I'm supposed to, I journal. 
and I use the scribe Bible journal. It has a place to write down what passages of Scripture that I'm reading for that day, and a place to write down what impressed me the most while I was reading those passages. In fact, let me explain why I journal. I found myself just reading through the Bible, and I really wasn't paying attention. And I would finish reading that portion that I was supposed to read, and I would close it, and I would think, what did I just read? Anyone ever done that? You're reading just to read. You're supposed to read the Bible, so you read the Bible, but you don't really pay attention to what you're reading. So what I found is, because I journal, I now have to pay attention. I start looking for what God is saying to me through it. I look for interesting things, things that I've never known before. And so I'll start highlighting. By the time I'm finished, I probably have highlighted between 8 to 10 things. And then what I do is I go back to those highlighted portions and I look for what impressed me the most out of that. And then there's a place to write down how that applies to my life. And then I take a moment to reflect on that and to offer up a quick prayer for God to help me in applying this in my life. And guess what? There's a place to write that down. There's also a place to help you memorize scripture by writing down a specific verse and you write down that same verse for two weeks. This week for me, it's been Romans chapter 8 verses 1 and 2. Therefore, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. For the spirit of the law in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. I use the version that I want, but I'm memorizing scripture as I'm doing this also. And last but not least, there's a place to record what you're thankful for. The truth is, optimism is the result of gratefulness. So every morning you have a chance to reflect on what you're thankful for. And if you've had a bad week or some things have gone wrong, you still have a chance to reflect on how God has been good to you and what you have and what God has done for you. So this fall, I intend to post a video each week featuring what I've gleaned from one of my quiet times for that week. Now, one of the things that I really love about the one-year Bible is that you always read one or two verses from the book of Proverbs. And people, that's what I want to talk about this morning, Proverbs. Everything else was just a freebie, just an encouragement for you to have a quiet time if you don't have a quiet time. But this morning's sermon is about Proverbs because it's such a great book, and I want to make sure that everyone here is taking full advantage of it. Listen to me, the book of Proverbs has the ability, it has the potential to change your life because it contains the secrets to success. So let's talk about Proverbs. First of all, Proverbs is a part of the Bible that's known as the wisdom literature. Now in case you don't know this, the wisdom literature consists of three books. It consists of the book of Job, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. Scholars refer to these books as the wisdom literature because they contain practical wisdom for living a life that's not only pleasing to God, but it's also a life that leads to personal success. In other words, they contain wise sayings concerning how to live a successful life and how to deal with all of its complexities. Yeah, the book of Job is good, makes you appreciate what you have. The book of Ecclesiastes is wonderful because it tells us the strongest warrior doesn't always win the battle. The fastest runner doesn't always win the race. That's kind of how life works. But it gives you some wise sayings and it helps you to deal with the complexities of life. Now, as we're talking about wisdom, let me ask you this. What's the difference between wisdom and knowledge? Does anyone know? Well, let me make it simple for you. Think of wisdom like this. Knowledge is what we would call being book smart. Wisdom is what we would call being street smart. In fact, how many times have you ever seen someone who is just extremely intelligent, but they don't have a lick of common sense? I mean, you know what I'm talking about. In essence, they have knowledge, but they don't have wisdom. In other words, they're book smart, but they're not street smart. Do you see the difference? In fact, let me go a little bit deeper. Wisdom in the biblical sense is the ability to observe the natural laws that God has set into place and to work with them in order to bring about personal success. In other words, 
It's the ability, the ability to understand how the world works and to use that knowledge to produce success in your life. In essence, it's the ability to use biblical principles to become successful. You see, principles are fundamental truths that explain how things work. As an example, marriage principles are fundamental truths that explain how marriage works. Parenting principles are fundamental truths that explain how parenting works. Financial principles are fundamental truths that explain how finances work. So if I want to be successful in the area of finances, I need to learn financial principles. And then I need to apply those principles to my finances. As an example, there's a financial principle that states that in order to prosper, you need to spend less than you make, save what you don't spend, and invest what you save. If you do that, your wealth will grow. If you don't do that, your wealth won't grow. It's as simple as that. Now, a lot of people know that principle, so they have a knowledge on how to prosper, but they don't actually do it, which means they lack wisdom. For whatever reason, they lack the ability to use that principle to succeed financially. That's the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to use biblical principles to succeed in life. Not just know them, but use them. If you've been coming a long time, I've taught a lot of marriage principles. So I've given you all of these fundamental truths that explain how marriage works. And you know these principles. The problem is the majority of you lack wisdom. You don't use those principles to have a better marriage. You have book knowledge, but you don't, or book smarts, but you don't have street smarts. You know them, but you don't use them. So as you study the book of Proverbs, you're going to find all these wise sayings. And if you're a smart person, you're going to categorize them. Because they don't always have them all together. You'll see a financial principle here and a financial principle there. A few chapters over, another financial pr uh, principle. A few chapters over, another one. And they're just scattered in there. So I would encourage you, as you're reading through the book of Proverbs, that you categorize them. And you learn those principles, but more importantly, you use wisdom in order to apply them so that you can succeed in life. Now, the first seven verses in Proverbs explain the purpose of the book. So turn with me, if you would, to the first chapter in the book of Proverbs, and let's read the first seven verses. I'm telling you, I read these first seven verses and I go, man, I want some of that. Listen to what it says. These are the Proverbs of Solomon David's son, king of Israel. Their purpose is to teach people wisdom and discipline. To help them understand the insights of the wise. Their purpose is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives. To help them do what is right, just, and fair. These proverbs will give insight to the simple. Knowledge and discernment to the young. Let the wise listen to these proverbs and become even wiser. Let those with understanding receive guidance by exploring the meaning in these proverbs and parables, the words of the wise, and their riddles. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. Wow. What a great book. Why? Because according to Solomon, these proverbs will help me to understand the insights of the wise. Verse 2. They will teach me how to live a successful life. Verse 3. They will give insight and knowledge even to those who are simple and young. Verse 4. Plus, if I'm already wise, they will make me even wiser. Verse 5. They will explain the meaning and the riddles of life. Verse 6. However... They won't do me any good unless I have the right foundation, which is the fear of the Lord. Verse 7. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay the right foundation in my life, and I'm going to dive into the book of Proverbs. I'm going to get me some of that success. People, I don't want to be like you. I don't want to be on my second, third, or fourth marriage. I don't want to have to divide half of my assets. 
I don't want to have to pay child support. I don't want to get, have to just see my kids on weekends every other week. No. I don't want that. I don't want to have problems in my finances. I don't want to get to the end of my life and now I'm ready to retire and all I have is Social Security. I don't want that. No. I want to have personal success and I also want to have spiritual success. So I want to get what the book of Proverbs offers. But before we get too excited, let's focus on verse 7 for a minute because verse 7 is very important. And the majority of us, we would read over those first seven verses and we would take, look at verse number seven and go, oh, yeah, 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 that's right. But it's probably more important than the first six verses. So look back at verse seven again and notice what it says. It says, the fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. Now, just how important is it to have the right foundation, which is the fear of the Lord? Well, let me show you something interesting by looking at Solomon's life. Turn to the end of the book, not the very end, almost the very end. Turn, turn to the end of the book, chapter 30, verse 1. And as you're turning there, let me give you some background information about Solomon. Solomon started off with a bang. And we all know the story. The Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream and he told him, Ask for me anything that you want and I'll give it to you. And Solomon Ask for wisdom. And if you want to read this story, you'll find it in 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. It's also found in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verses 7 through 12. Well, you know what happened. Solomon asked for wisdom so that he could be a righteous and just king, so that he could govern the nation of Israel according to the way that God wanted him to. And God was so pleased, he told Solomon that not only was he going to give him wisdom, but he was also going to give him wealth. Riches and fame. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. God said to Solomon, Because your greatest desire is to help your people, and you did not ask for wealth, riches, or fame, or even the death of your enemies, or a long life, but rather you asked for wisdom and knowledge to properly govern my people. I will certainly give you the wisdom and knowledge that you request. But I will also give you wealth, riches, and fame, such as no other king has had before you or will ever have in the future. Boy, Solomon started off with a bang. God's on his side. He gives him this wisdom. But over time, Solomon's heart changed. And he no longer had a heart after God like his father David. In fact, it was his numerous wives that turned his heart away from God. So God told Solomon that he was going to divide his kingdom as punishment. He wouldn't do it in Solomon's lifetime for the sake of David, but he would do it during his son's reign. In fact, let's read that passage of scripture that tells us what happened. Look at 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 1 through 13. Now, King Solomon loved Many, not just a few. We're going to find out how many in just a minute. He loved many foreign women. Besides Pharaoh's daughter, he married women from Moab, Ammon, Edom, Sidon, and from among the Hittites. The Lord had clearly instructed the people of Israel, you must not marry them because they will turn your hearts to their gods. Yet Solomon insisted on loving them anyway. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. Good Lord, if the man had sex every day, once a day, it would take him almost three years to sleep with each one of them. Every man's thinking about that's why I brought that up. Every woman's going, oh, thank God, you only have to have sex once every three years and 30 years, 10 times. I'm just teasing. Okay, I'm sorry if I offended anyone. We'll move on. But he had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. And in fact, they did turn his heart away from the Lord. In Solomon's old age, now you need to understand, when it says old age, it actually means maturity. When he was around 35, all right? We need to understand it's not talking about what we think. When we hear old age, we think 70, 75. 
Well, we know that Solomon began reigning probably between the ages of 20 to 25. It doesn't actually tell us. It tells us that he reigned for 40 years. He actually died between the ages of 60 to 65. So when it says old age, it's not talking about 70, 75, or 80. It's talking about around 35. Okay? Let's keep going. In Solomon's old age, about 35, they turned his heart to worship other gods instead of being completely faithful to the Lord as God as his father David had been. Solomon worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. In this way, Solomon did what was evil in the Lord's sight. He refused to follow the Lord completely as his father David had done. On the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, he even built a pagan shrine for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and another for Molech. They want to know who Molech was? Molech was the detestable god of the Ammonites. But he had open arms, he was made of brass, had a place to build the fire, they would get it cherry red, and then you would offer your firstborn on it. You literally burned your child to death. You place it in the arms, it'd be cherry red, it would roll down into the fire, and the child would be burned to death. He built one of those. Golly. Verse 8. Solomon built such shrines for all his foreign wives to use for burning incense and sacrificing to their gods. The Lord was very angry with Solomon, for his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel who had appeared to him twice. Wow. God had appeared to him twice. God's done some wonderful things for you, and yet you've turned away. That's human nature. We have the tendency to do that. He had warned Solomon specifically about worshiping other gods. But Solomon did not listen to the Lord's command. So now the Lord said to him, since you have not kept my covenant and have disobeyed my decrees, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your servants. We find out later on in the chapter, to keep on reading this, Jeroboam is the person. But for the sake of your father David, I will not do this while you are still alive. I will take the kingdom away from your son, and even so I will not take away the entire kingdom. I will let him be king of one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, my chosen city. Now, most people blame Rehoboam for dividing the kingdom. But you need to understand Rehoboam was just a pawn. If he hadn't done what he did, God was still going to divide the kingdom because he prophesied that. And he was doing it as punishment for what Solomon had done. So who was really responsible for dividing the kingdom? Solomon. You see, regardless of what Rehoboam had done, God already prophesied that the kingdom would be split as a result of Solomon's sin. In fact, you really need to read the last part of the story uh, in that chapter to really get a good picture of it. So here's the point that I'm trying to make. Solomon started off with a bang, but around the age of 35, Solomon's heart changed. And he turned away from God, and he became very hedonistic. And the book of Ecclesiastes, the first three chapters, paints a really good picture of what happened during that period of time. However, at the end of his life, somewhere between the ages of 60 to 65, Solomon realized what he had done and how wrong he had been, so he repented, and he came back to the Lord. Now, most scholars think that the wake-up call was when God told him that he was going to punish him, by splitting the kingdom because that happened towards the end of his life but that's when Solomon woke up and he realized just how foolish he'd been and that's what you need to know before we jump in to the end of the book he started off with a bang but his wives turned his heart away from the Lord however at the end of his life he repented and he came back to the Lord and he finishes the book of Proverbs from what he's learned that's what you need to know so now that you know that, look at verses 1 through 4 in chapter 30. Notice what it says. The sayings of Agur, the son of Jacob, containing, contains this message. I am weary, O God. I am weary and worn out, O God. I am too stupid to be human. And I lack common sense. I have not mastered human wisdom because I don't know the Holy One. Who but God goes up to heaven and comes back down? Who holds the wind in his fist? Who wraps up the ocean in his cloak? Who has created the whole wide world? 
What is his name in his son's name? Tell me if you know. Now, who in the world is Agur? Does anyone know who Agur is? Because we were told at the very start of the book that these are proverbs by Solomon, king of Israel. So all of a sudden, Agur starts speaking. Who in the world is Agur? It's Solomon. Yeah. You see, Agur is a derogatory epithet. Everyone knows what an epithet is, right? An epithet is a characterizing word that's used in place of the true name of a person. In other words, it's a nickname that characterizes a person. As an example, let's suppose that you love baseball and you play baseball, but you stink at batting. In fact, you strike out every time you come to the plate. So your teammates start calling you slugger. Well, that's a humorous and derogatory epithet, slugger. Because people would hear that and go, wow, you can really tag the ball? Say, well, no, I strike out all the time. That's why they call me slugger. That's a derogatory epithet. It's a nickname that characterizes you, especially as it pertains to baseball. Now, don't confuse the words epitaph with epithet. They're two different things. An epitaph is a memorial statement about someone who's died. It's what you write on a person's tombstone. That's an epitaph. She was a loving mother and a loving wife who was pleasing to God. That's not an epithet. That's not a nickname. That's a memorial statement you put on a tombstone. All right? An epithet is a nickname that describes or characterizes a person. Well, agar is a derogatory epithet for Solomon. You see, agar means gathered or stored up. But here's why Solomon referred to himself as Agur. Solomon had gathered all of this wisdom. He'd stored up all of these wise things in books over his lifetime. And he also stored up what we would call success. Just look at what he had, everything that he did in his life. In fact, Solomon was supposedly the wisest man that's ever lived. And yet, he didn't know God. And at the end of his life... He realized well, a fool, what a fool he'd been. Because the proper foundation for true wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And it hit him. I am too stupid to be human. I lack common sense. I've not mastered human wisdom. And every one of us would go, what do you mean you've not mastered human wisdom? You wrote the book of Proverbs. You wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. There's not two wiser books than that. And yet he says at the end of his life, I'm too stupid to be human. I lack common sense. I've not mastered human wisdom. Why? Because I don't know God. Wow. Now, let me give you a principle. And if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. I'm giving you a fundamental truth that explains how life works. So if I were you, I'd write this down. So you can be book smart, but more importantly, street smart. Here it is. You can know and understand all of the Proverbs in the book. But if you don't know God and his son, you're a fool. That's right. You can be successful in everything you do and in every area of your life. But if you don't know God and you don't know his son, you're a fool. Because God and his son are the foundation for true wisdom. In other words, true wisdom comes from them. And it will steer you to what truly matters in life. It will steer you to true success. It will give you eternal success. You see, we look at certain people and we think, what a successful person they are. They have this money. They had a great marriage. They had great kids. They have all these assets. They got to do what they wanted in life. They traveled. They did all of these things. And yet, if that person doesn't know God and his son, they will die and not go to heaven. But let's suppose that maybe they knew God and his son, but they didn't live for him. Well, they have all those things, but when they die, they get to go to heaven, but they don't have any spiritual rewards there. There's no treasure in heaven. 
They had success on this earth, which is temporal and fleeting, but they had no success in eternity. That's not success, people. This is why the foundation for true wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Because when you recognize who God is and who his son is, then you can build with these, these principles that he's given you to not only have success in this life, but more importantly, success in the life to come. Not only do you get to go to heaven, but you stored up treasure there. You're going to receive rewards. But that brings up something interesting. You notice I've been saying God and his son. Well, I want you to look back at verses 3 and 4. And it doesn't matter what version you have, the law mentioned God and his son. Look at verses 3 and 4. Notice what they say. I have not mastered human wisdom because I don't know the Holy One. Who but God goes up to heaven and comes back down? Who holds the wind in his fist? Who wraps up the oceans in his cloak? Who has created the whole wide world? What is his name? What is his name? It's not God. It's Yahweh. Yeah, he's revealed his name as Yahweh. What is his name? But then he goes further. And his son's name. Tell me if you know. God has a son. Now people, this is the Old Testament. But Solomon in the Old Testament mentions God's son. And what is his name? Jesus. But my point is this. Even the Old Testament talks about God's son. And if you don't know Jesus, you're a fool. Now, the reason why he says, do you know God's name is because Yahweh is the covenant-keeping name of God. You only know God if you're in covenant with him. But not only that, you only have salvation if you know who the Messiah is, who God's son is, and that's Jesus. So to truly have success, you not only have to know God, but you also have to know his son, who is Jesus. And even the Old Testament talks about God's son. You didn't catch that, did you? No. But let's go a little bit deeper and look at the very last chapter. Let's look at chapter 31. Now, those of you who are familiar with Proverbs chapter 31, you know that it talks about the virtuous woman. But what about the virtuous man? Does Proverbs 31 say anything about the virtuous man? Well, of course it does. In verses 1 through 9. We just never read it. We want to jump to the last part in chapter 31 and say, women, this is the way you need to be. And we set this real high standard for you. Well, women turn it around on men and say, where's the virtuous man? It's in verses 1 through 9. Let's read it. Notice what it says. The sayings of King Lemuel contain this message which, is, which his mother taught him. The best things I learned were from my mom. My dad was extremely intelligent. In fact, I'll say this. If my dad was still alive, he'd be the smartest man in this room. Bar none. My dad's PhD was in physical chemistry. Layman's terms, the mathematical modeling of chemical equations. I can remember when we had uh, Traco up here and heat and air came in and it would make ripples in that. It was just for decoration on the stage. And my dad looked at that and said, you know, if you plotted that, this is probably, I think he said algebraic formula, but don't hold me to that. That would describe what that's doing in the waves. I grew up where people would come to the house that were doctors. They had my dad when they were getting their undergraduate and then they would go on to med school and they'd come in and they'd start talking about certain things and They'd be talking about some of their interesting cases. And my dad would say, well, do you know why that happens? And they would go, no, no, doc, I don't. And dad would explain why that happened in the body with chemistry. My dad was just extremely intelligent. But let me tell you, what really stuck with me and what has really helped me more in life is what my mom taught me. Because my mom taught me the things of God. So notice what this says. The sayings of King Lemuel contain this message, which his mother taught him. Oh, my son, oh, my son of my womb, oh, son of my vows, do not waste your strength on women, on those who ruin kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, to guzzle wine. Rulers should not crave alcohol, for if they drink, 
they may forget the law and not give justice to the oppressed. Alcohol is for the, for the dying and wine for those in bitter distress. Let them drink to forget their poverty and remember their troubles no more. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those being crushed. Yes, speak up for the poor and helpless and see that they get justice. Now, who in the world is Lemuel? Well, again, this is an epithet for Solomon. Because at the very end of his life, he returned to God. And because he returned to God, here he refers to himself as Lemuel. What does Lemuel mean? Lemuel means for God. You see, Lemuel is a compound word, which simply means it's made up of more, more than one word. In this case, it's made up of two words. The word limo, which is a preposition which means for, and el, which means God. Now, when you combine these two words, you get Lemuel, and it literally means for God. Now, Lemuel is a king. So King Lemuel means the king for God. And that's how Solomon started off. He was a king for God. But his wives turned his heart away from God. And he became very, very hedonistic. Just read what it says about him and read the book of Ecclesiastes. However, at the end of his life, he regretted that and he repented. So at the end of the book of Proverbs, he ends with these words, For all the kings in the world. Now men, listen to me because this is very important. Every man that has a family is a king. He's the king of his destiny. He's the king of his castle. He's the king of his family. So these words are for every man that has a family. In these nine verses, Solomon tells us how to be a virtuous king. Or in other words, how to be a virtuous man in order to rule over our family the way we're supposed to. So knowing that, let's read this passage of scripture again. The sayings of King Lemuel contain this message. Which his mother taught him. Oh my son, oh my son, oh son of my womb, oh son of my vows. Do not waste your strength on women, on those who ruin kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, to guzzle wine. Rulers should not crave alcohol. For if they drink, they may forget the law and not give justice to the oppressed. And you can keep reading it. But here's what I want you to get out of this. As a virtuous man... You're to be a righteous and just king who establishes peace in your home. And Solomon warns us of two things. He doesn't say, here's two, ten things you need to be wary of. No, no, no. He warns us of two things. And he should know because he succumbed to both of them. And, that's what, and those two things are women and liquor. The two greatest vices. Now, people, I didn't say that. Solomon did. Look at verses 3 through 5. Do not waste your strength on women, on those who ruin kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, to guzzle wine. Rulers should not crave alcohol. For if they drink, they may forget the law and not give justice to the oppressed. First, he warns us about women. Now, the word women is plural and not singular in the original Hebrew. So he's not talking about your wife. He's talking about being a womanizer or a philanderer. Yeah. I'm going to tell you. Men who are woman, womanizers. Will never be a godly king. In fact you will ruin your family. Women will ruin you as a king. Not your wife. Women who are not your wife. And then he warns us about alcohol. But in all fairness, he says, guzzling wine and craving strong drink. So he's not condemning drinking, he's condemning drunkenness. I want to make myself clear when I say that. And then he tells us why he condemns drunkenness. When you're drunk, you forget God's law. And you don't rule justly. In fact, you tend to oppress others, especially your family members. And then he takes it a step further and he tells us what alcohol is good for. Listen to me. You want to know what alcohol is good for? Let's read it. Verses 6 and 7. Alcohol is for the dying. And wine for those in bitter distress. Let them drink to forget their poverty and remember their troubles no more. Are you dying? 
Are you in bitter distress? Do you want to forget your miserable life of poverty and trouble? Well, that's what getting drunk is good for and nothing else. And Solomon should know because he lived a very hedonistic life. So what's the bottom line, Pastor? The bottom line is you can know and understand all of the Proverbs in the book. And you can be tremendously successful. But if you don't know God, and especially his son Jesus, you're a fool. And your epithet should be agar. You're too stupid to be human. You have not mastered human wisdom. And you think that I'm wrong, but let me tell you. I've done more funerals for people who do not, did not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And you know, I feel like such a hypocrite. Because for the family, I want to bring some comfort. So I get up there and I talk about what a good person they are on this earth. But inside I know, they're not in heaven. They're going to be punished for all eternity. Because they did not know God or his son. Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, you can have tremendous success in this life, but if you don't know Jesus, it's all for vain. It's for this temporary time of 60, 70, maybe 80 years. If you're lucky, you can live to your 90s. But let me tell you, many of those years will be good years. And then for all eternity, you're separated from God. Let me tell you, you got to be plumb, dumb, stupid not to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Well, you just offended me. Someone needs to. Let's stand. This is a wake-up call. Solomon did not wake up until God came to him and he said, You know what? You not listen to me. You've not followed my commands. You've not followed the law. You've gone serving after other gods. I'm going to rip the kingdom from you. But for your, for your father's sake, David, I'm not going to do it in your lifetime. I'm going to do it in your son's. And you know what Solomon did? He straightened up. Oh, my gosh. God's going to punish me. I've been a fool. And then he says this. I'm too stupid to be human. He realized Anyone with any wisdom wouldn't have done what I've done, even though I've gathered all this wisdom. I'm eager. Maybe this is your wake-up call. And for the first time in your life, you're going, oh my gosh, I've been going after this and this and this and thinking I'm successful. And now I realize, if I die like this, I'm not going to heaven. This is your wake-up call. It's the wake-up call that Solomon had. That's why he ends Proverbs with chapter 30 and chapter 31 the way he does. He calls himself eager, too stupid to be human. I have no common sense. I have not mastered human wisdom. And then he turns around and he says, I'm now King Lemuel. I'm going to be a king for God for these last few years. Be King Lemuel. Live for God. And you can't live for God unless you're living for Jesus. So if you're here this morning and you've never received Jesus, let me tell you, that's what you need to do. Because no one can get to heaven except through Jesus. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes into the Father except through me. In other words, if you want to get to heaven, you have to do it through Jesus. So if you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you want to go to heaven when you die, I'm going to give you the opportunity. I want everyone here to bow their heads, close their eyes. If you want to receive Jesus, all you have to do is repeat this prayer after me. Now this prayer is not magic. Just because you say it doesn't mean that you get to go to heaven. But if you mean what you're saying, then you will get to go to heaven. So, here goes. Repeat after me. You can even say it silently. God, I know I'm a sinner. And God, I know I, I deserve to be punished. But God, I believe you love me. And because you love me, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for my sin. To take my punishment. And I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. And I also believe that when he died, he descended into hell to pay the penalty for my sin. 
But I also believe that when all my sin was paid for, God, you raised Jesus from the dead, which means all of my sin has been completely paid for. Jesus, I put my trust in you. I want you to be Lord of my life. I want to be King Lemuel. I want to be the king who lives for God. I'm going to live for you. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me.